Bible confession. No weapon. Isaiah 54, 17, I'm reading out the King James Version. It says, no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. And every tongue that rise against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is quick and is powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, and it will do what you sent it for to do. And I pray, Lord, for increase this morning. And we thank you for that you made our hearts good ground at your word fall along. Give us understanding. Thank you for your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. You can be seated. All right, like I said earlier, I've entitled this morning's message, Message No Weapon. Okay, so in chapter 53 of Isaiah, Isaiah, he's talking about what Jesus Christ was going to come and do for his church. And this proves that God loves his church and there is nothing that God would not do for his church. So in chapter 54, what we just read, we have the comfort that God gives us because of what Christ was going to come and do for his church. So along with the comfort comes the promise that we just read that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. And God is the only one who can make that claim because number one, my first point is that God is in total control. God is in total control. Now, we need to know that people never have the final say so in our lives. Even though sometimes it feels like they have the final say but God has the final say. And one of the biggest reasons that no weapon formed against you shall prosper because even through mankind's sin, God is in total control. And one of the biggest reasons that no weapon formed against you shall prosper is the verse 16 that's leading up to what he said. No weapon formed against thee shall prosper. Isaiah 54, 16, it says, behold, this is God talking. He says, I have created the blacksmith who blows the coals in the fire, who brings forth an instrument for his work. And I have created the spoiler to destroy. What God is saying, this is one of the biggest reasons why no weapon formed against us shall prosper, is because God is the one who created the people and he is the one that created all the weapons. So when you know that God is the one he created all these things, he, we can say with confidence, no weapon formed against thee shall prosper. Because this is one of the biggest reasons why right here. Because he, look what he says, he says, I have created the blacksmith. God is saying he is the one that created the person who even want to do you harm. God created that person. And the weapon that that person used to, uh, to try to do something against you, God say he is the one that created the weapon. He is the one that got told to control. So that's why he says no weapon formed against the church shall prosper. It's not going to, it's not, it does not have the final say. God has the final say. He is in total control. Matter of fact, the thing that they're going to uh, use to try to stop you, God is using it for your good. So the reason, so that's one of the biggest reasons. Even if they did something to us, even the extent of what they do is still under God's control. That's why he says no weapon formed against, against us shall prosper. Now, God created these people, right? He created the weapons. And this also includes Satan. So you got to remember, Satan, he is a created being. God created him. And God created Satan. So remember, he said he created the spoiler to destroy. And we know the enemy come to kill, steal, and destroy. He is the one that try to spoil the goods of the Christian and the world of mankind. But God says, I created him. So there's no need to fear him. I created him. So that's one of the, another reason why no weapon formed against us shall prosper. So we see God's control over Satan even in the story of Job. In Job chapter 1 verse 12. Now just a little backdrop. At one point in time, God, you know, had all the angels come before him. So he sees Satan in the midst of the angels and he asks Satan, he says, what are you doing here? So Satan telling me, he said, I've been walking back and forth, to and fro. Looking for somebody to devour. I've been, I've been trying to get at somebody. So, so God tell me, say, well, have you considered Job? So Satan tells him, well, he only blessing you because of the things that you, he only praising you because of what you given him. But if you remove that hedge of protection, let me get at him and I promise you he ain't going to uh, worship you no more. He ain't going to love you no more. He only love you because of the stuff. So God, so this is what God tells him. God say, okay, 
Job 1.12, he says, And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he has is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thy hand. In other words, God was saying, His life you can't touch. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Our enemy can only do what God has allowed him to do to us. That's why he says no weapon formed against us shall prosper. God hasn't allowed Satan to take you out because God is in total control. And what Satan has planned for you, he promises that it will not prosper. It doesn't have the final say. Matter of fact, Satan is a created being, so he needs God's permission to get at us. We see that. We see God's in control over Satan. Even in the life of Peter, Luke 22, 31 says, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. Verse 32 says, But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. So we need to thank God that Satan cannot do whatever he wants, because God has created him, and he got, and he got tight reins on him. Satan is on God's leash. And Satan, got, and Satan cannot do anything without, without God's permission to you. And God created him, and he is in total control. And that's one of the biggest reasons that we should bless God, that no weapon formed against thee shall prosper. Even in your prayer life, you can say this confidently, knowing what this says right here, that no weapon, regardless of what it feels like, regardless of what it is, that it will not prosper. So. We see that Satan is under God's control and people are under God's control. So after Jesus, this is Jesus telling this to Peter. So after Jesus told Peter that he was like, you know, Satan want to sift you as wheat. Satan got a plan for you. He says that, but I have prayed for thee. So Jesus left Peter with some comforting words. And that brings me to my second point, which is the fact that this promise of no weapon formed against thee shall prosper is really meant as a comfort to us. It's meant to comfort us because we live in a fallen world and things happen and we need to be comforted when we go through things. But no matter the situation, God, he still wants us to be comforted because like he promises, no weapon formed against thee shall prosper. Second Corinthians chapter one, verses three and four. The situation looked bleak, but, but, but Paul was still uh, able to bless God. He says, blessed be God, even the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. So at the beginning of Paul's letter to the Corinthians, he gave his usual greeting, and then he goes on to bless God for comforting him and his ministry partners for the trials that they go through. Because remember, this is meant as a comfort to us. Now check it out what Paul says that in, uh, in verse 4. What we just read, he says, the reason why God comforted through them, comforted them through the trials, the reason why God allowed them to go through the tribulations, he says, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble. So this tells us that we benefit from having close relationships with other Christians, with other believers. We benefit from that. And the reason why is because Christians who have gone through, they know how to comfort others when they go through, because in this life we need to be comforted. God wants us to be comforted. So just by getting to know one another, we would find out that people have gone through some of the same things that the rest of our brothers and sisters go through. And some people have gone through even worse things than what we have gone through. And when we go through, it feels like we go through alone because sometimes it's what it feels like. But that's not true. First Peter 5, 9. Remember, the promise, no weapon formed against us shall prosper is a comfort to us. This is a comforting thing. First Peter 5, 9. He says, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. The all, the all it's saying is the same things that we go through. Others are going through it too and have been through it. He says it's the same thing. It's nothing new. The Bible says it's nothing new under the sun. It's no new affliction. It's no, it's no new trial. People have gone through these, through these things before. But what a brother or sister will tell you that it's, not t it's only temporary. It won't last always. And the temptation is to feel like your struggle is unique and more different than anybody else's. And it's comforting to know that, number one, that we're not alone in the struggle, and number two, that God has a goal he wants accomplished in us. 
And I'm trying to tell you this because I'm trying to stir up some comfort in you that God has an end goal for First Peter 5, 10, right after he says that knowing that the same afflictions are accomplishing your brother that are in the world. He says, but the God of all grace who has called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. After that, you have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. This is the end goal for, uh, for us as believers that God has, that we will be perfect. That means fully mature believers after going through some stuff, that, he, that we would be established, established in the faith. Your heart has to say, I'm not moving, I'm not going nowhere, I'm not turning my back on God. You know, so then he says strengthen. God, it's okay to be weak at a certain point in your Christianity, but as, as, as you grow, you're supposed to be strong. He says strengthen you, and then he says settle you, that your heart just won't be moved, and that your heart will be at peace, and, he, and that you would be settled no matter what goes on in your life. That is the end goal of God. That's why it is meant for comfort. That's why no weapon formed against you shall prosper. These are the things that you have to have in your spiritual arsenal. Even when you go to God in prayer, you have to know this in your heart. This is vital for the Christian. This is important. This is why we have to know God's word. So Peter, he was qualified to comfort just like Paul was because they both went through. Peter and Paul, they, didn't, they, they had it rough a thousand times rougher than what we had. But remember what Paul said, what we read, he says that we may, may be able to comfort others. When God allows you to go through, God would allow you to go through so you can be able to comfort others who are about to go through the same thing. And you can tell them, hey, but the end goal is that God wants you perfect, established, strengthened, and that your heart will be settled. So, now, back to our main text, no weapon formed against us shall prosper. Okay, he says, nothing against the believer shall prosper, but on the other hand, which brings me to my third point, God wants us, the church, to prosper. He wants you to be successful. But to be a prosperous Christian, we need to know God's word. We need to know God's word. Now, pastor, he preached last week, the message, what he had was success as a Christian. God wants us to be successful because all that word prosper, it just means to go forward, to have victory, to not go back, but to keep on moving forward. We have to know God's word if you're gonna be prosperous. Joshua 1, 8, this is the importance of knowing God's word. This is what God tells Joshua. He says, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou may observe to do according to all that is written therein, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. This is what God is telling Joshua because it was time for Joshua to take the reins because Mo Moses had died. So it was Joshua time to step up in leadership. And God told Joshua, you got to take the children to the promised land because you have to meditate on the word. This is what is going to get you there. So why meditate day and night? Because anything that says opposite of what God says, you have to cast it down anything. That's why you have to meditate day and night. Just on Sunday morning is not good enough. Just on Wednesday evening, that's not good enough. You have Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, where he says day and night. Because anything other than what God says will make us doubt his promises. It's not good enough to hear this just one time. It's not good enough. He told Joshua, meditate day and night. Because I can only imagine back then, uh, Joshua had millions of people to lead. So I can only imagine what some of them people was probably trying to say was like, man, it's too hard. We can't do it. We can't take it. Imagine if Joshua focused on that. Imagine if you focus on all the negative, all the evil, all the doubt. You would never be a prosperous Christian. But that's why God tells us meditate therein day and night. Day and night. Every single day, every night. Meditate on God's word. Also, to be a prosperous Christian, because remember, God wants us, the church, to prosper. No weapon formed against us shall prosper, but God wants us to prosper. Also, to be prosperous, we need to be specific in our prayer life. Be specific. Romans chapter 1, verse 10. This is an example of the Apostle Paul being specific on what he wanted, uh, God, he wanted from God. He says, making requests, talking about his prayer, 
If by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. Like I said, Paul was being specific of what he was praying for. Now, for example, as a church, we can be specific. For example, we can pray things like, Father, give me a hunger for your word. You can say, Father, give me passion for the things of God. You can say, Father, give me a desire to pray to you more. You can be specific when it comes to the things of God because God is God. He wants you to get him involved in the everyday details of your life. Stop being general in your prayer. Be specific. OK, so when we know what God says, because to be a prosperous Christian, we have to know his word. When we know what God says, we also see his faithfulness toward us. Joshua 1, 5, the faithfulness of God by knowing his word. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. This is the faithfulness of God, because even when we fail God, and sometimes we do, he does not fail us. Even when we walk away from God, sometimes you might have that mindset. He never walks away from us. He says, I will not fail thee. I am not leaving. God says, as I was with Moses, Moses did great things, but the key was God was with him. If you put your faith in Christ Jesus, then God himself is with you. Now, the same God that was with Moses, the same God that was with Joshua, it's the same God who was in us. And notice I, did, I said with us earlier, but because of what Christ did, God is in us. If you have Christ as your savior, if you are born again, then the Lord Jesus Christ is in us. That is the way that we become prosperous. We need God in us to be prosperous because when he is in us, we change. Second Corinthians 5, 17 says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. We change. Our desires change. Our motives change. The way we think begins to change. That's how we start to make our way prosperous because when, those, when your mind and your heart change, you don't live according to your old way no more. You don't even have a desire for that no more. Your life starts to turn a little bit because that mind and that heart gotta change. If that mind and that heart don't change, you ain't gonna be prosperous. You ain't, you're not gonna be prosperous. You just gonna keep on living the way you're living because that mind and that heart is gonna always want something that God does not want. So Christ is in us. So we are new creatures and we have to put that on and we have to keep our reminding ourselves of this every single day. That's God is in us. First John chapter four, verse four. Another another verse that tells us that God is in us. He says, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. John was telling the people back then, he says, we don't prosper by no power of our own, but we prosper because God is in us. That is how we prosper. Ephesians chapter three, verse 20. He says that now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that does what it works in us. This Holy Spirit power is in the believer. God is in us. And our question should be, what do you want, God, what do you want to do through us? That should be our question to God, because God has a plan for all of us. You know, God has a plan. If God is in you, then he has a plan. Knowing that God being in us means that we will prosper. Because remember, God wants us as a church to prosper. Romans 8, 31 says, what shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He's asking that question. God is for you. Who can stand against God? Nobody can stand against God. And Paul is asking that question, it's kind of rhetorical. He was like, if God be for us, then who can be against us? And what he's saying in this chapter is, is, Jesus Christ is the one who paid the price for you. He's the one that rendered you innocent and forgiven. So he says, if somebody else says that you're not forgiven, if God himself is the one who said it, and if God himself is the one who did it, then he's saying, if God be for us, then who can be? Who can be against us? So that's why no weapon formed against us shall prosper because nobody can stand against God. And people have been coming against the plan of God for a long time. And God, we, we sung this morning, God is victorious. He is Jehovah Nisi, the Lord, my banner. That's, what, that's who he is. He reigns in victory. We sung that this morning.
He reigns in victory. We just have to believe it and walk by faith to apply it. And I'm coming to a close. My last point is that back to the main text when he says, no weapon formed against thee shall prosper. Now the last part of that verse is my last point, which when God says, their righteousness is of me, said the Lord. Now, when Christ Jesus died on the cross, something happened called, I like to call it the great exchange. Because apart from Jesus Christ, we have no righteousness. We are unrighteous. No matter how nice, no matter how good, you are unrighteous in the eyes of God because God is perfectly holy and he is 100% righteous and we are not just by our nature. So you need the righteousness of Christ. But this is the faithfulness of God. God does that for us. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, the great exchange happened. Jesus took our unrighteousness, all our perversion, all our self-righteousness, pride, lust, envy, all those things. Second Corinthians 5, 21. This is the great exchange. This is why God says their righteousness is of me. We have Jesus Christ as, his, as, as our righteousness. He says, for he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. God took all of our sin, put it on Christ, and God took Christ's perfect life and put it on you. That is the great exchange. So by doing this, God fully makes us right with him. There is no doubt in the mind of God that you are right with him if you have Jesus Christ as your savior, because Christ Jesus, is him alone, is our righteousness. This should give us rest, because knowing that I can't do nothing good enough to get to make myself right with God, I could do a thousand things right, and that still won't make me right. Jesus is my righteousness. Him, him his death on the cross is your righteousness. He, he lived the perfect life because we couldn't. Even in Jesus Christ, even in his thought, in, in his motive, it was 100% all for the Father. And he was our substitute. So he says he made, but the, the cross at that time, it was ugly because of the gruesomeness that he went through. But that was our sin being put on him. And the Father put his wrath upon Jesus and in exchange. We are that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's why God can boldly say their righteousness is of me. They ain't, ain't no you can't even condemn my people. I have I have justified my people. Look at what he says. Romans 8, 33. And I'm coming to a close. He says, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Who can charge you with anything? It is God that justifies. God is the one that makes us right. Justified, just in other words, that word justified, that's another word for righteousness. God is the one that did it. So in God's mind, case is closed. You are the perfect righteousness of God. He says, their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. The beautiful thing about this verse is you know all what you did. It's not like you tried to hide anything against God. You know all what you did, but you put your faith in Christ. And, and that's why he says it is God that justifies. So I'm closing with this. God has made sure that in Christ, no weapon formed against us shall prosper. Nothing has the final say, only God. God himself alone has the final say in our life. And I'm closing with that. That's all I have. But um, I'm going to open up the 